Hi, in this video we're gonna take a look at request interception with Playwright together with some other network manipulation techniques that will enable us to monitor and uh, even modify the traffic as it is happening during our uh, Playwright session. Pause now if you would like more details. Okay, let's go. I have already set up a simple script that is navigating to Etsy.com, dismissing a couple of pop-ups and searching for a specific product. First off, let's understand where we're at. Let's take a look at how this works before we introduce any request interception. I'm gonna run this using the inspector so that we can explore it together step by step. So here we have our session beginning and we can step through the different steps here and what you see happening is we load the website, we dismiss the first pop-up, uh, we start typing into the bar up there and hit enter and then you know sometimes you do get this weird effect where you are uh, you're presented with another pop-up in this case this is not coming up not a problem but the important thing is that we see how things are looking like right now and we can now start to do a few different interesting things using the technique of request interception. So first off, you know, when we are actually loading a website such as, uh, such as Etsy.com or any other, there will be something going on uh, in the network tab here. That's because, let, let us just reload this page real quick. You know, our browser is, uh, needs to fetch different assets, uh, of course, everything from the HTML to the scripts to some of the images that you see here, right? So here we can see uh, the image that was sent over for, excuse me, for this uh, specific tile, for this product tile here. Um, and, you know, so there's a lot of information here. Uh, we can see all the headers for, uh, you know, requests and responses. So there's, there's really a lot of information here. And we can, of course, have, you know, having access to the dev tools we can look at everything that's going on also through Playwright as things are happening. And we can also do more than that. So, but let's start easy. Let's first look at how we can intercept the requests and the responses that are happening during our test script. One thing that's very important to understand is events. You can start out by looking at how Playwright handles events in case you have uh, had no previous introduction. Uh, what we're doing here is pretty much straight out of the documentation. We are uh, printing out the URL of a request uh, whenever we catch one, right? So here we're waiting for the request event and then just doing the logging. And uh, if you can go past this though i'd really recommend you know going to uh you know your uh your mdn docs or uh similar source and just uh, read up on the concept of events right and you will find that that's very uh, very interesting and um really helpful in general okay let's run again our intercept.js you see the website loading and the usual things happening and what you see here in the console, of course, is what we were expecting. So all the different uh, target URLs of all the different requests that are being sent out as we run the script are being printed out here. Don't expect to understand everything here. Uh, if you don't have a background in web development, it might be a little confusing. But in general, you can see here, um, you can understand a lot just by reading the URL. So you can see that we have some sort of request that is going to a probably some sort of domain that is hosting static assets, right? And we see here, these look pretty much, so we see the .jpeg, right? So this is an image file. And we also see uh, what might be the resolution of that specific uh, image, right? So this might be a thumbnail, right? Maybe we are also able to access it directly in the browser. You know, what we're doing here is just pulling all these small images to essentially fill in that home page, right? So we already can understand, uh, can break down a lot of what is happening when the page is being loaded. By taking a quick look at the official docs, we're able to see all the different things that we can do with the request, right? In this case, let's try to extract a little bit more information and enrich the logs that we are printing out right now. 
we could, for example, add uh, the uh, request method and maybe the resource type uh, just before we go ahead and print out the URL. So that will be a resource type just like that. Okay, you can see this is a little bit um, a little bit clearer right now because we're getting the, the different methods, right? We see a lot of gets uh, for the images, of course, here. And then we are, uh, you know, we have some posts hitting the API. And, it, you know, there's going to be, again, a lot of things here. But uh, if you actually want to understand uh, what is happening when a page is loading, it might be easier to just take a look at the dev tools if that's what you're into. But anyway, this is a very interesting thing to know. There's many things that you can do with this, of course, because you can uh, essentially listen on requests and then, you know, extract a bunch of information and then uh, use that information to decide to do or, or not do something, right? And we'll see a bit more about that in a minute. But for the moment, let's also take a look at uh, responses, right? Because we can also monitor those. For response objects, we're going to have access to different methods. In this case, what I'm going to do is log out the status code together with the uh, URL, which is going to be the same as um, our request, of course. So kicking it off again. And if I remove this first line, what you can see is actually the uh, kind of like the back and forth that is going on uh, between, you know, requests, um, leaving uh, outbound requests, let's say, and responses to those requests coming back. And this is kind of like uh, really a log of everything that's going on uh, there network wise, request and response wise. And you can see, you know, our um, our browser essentially is going ahead and requesting different different files, different images, and then it's receiving them in case everything is fine. You know, if one of those images were uh, unavailable, uh, we wouldn't get a 200 uh, as a response. We would probably get a 404 or something like that. So as you can see, there's a lot of information that we can access there. And for many use cases, this is going to be essential. So far, we've only logged things, right? Let's go ahead and do something a little bit more consequential. So in this case, what I want to do is just get rid of my logging here and uh, of my event listeners. And I actually want to, let's say, get rid of some of the requests, right? Once we start loading the page, you know, the browser will, will have to, you know, request a few different files, right? And let's say that I want to not ask for certain files at all. It might be that uh, when we're running our, our playwright check, for example, or test, we don't want to download all the images. Maybe we're actually doing scraping, right? And we're only interested in the text and we're doing high volume. So we don't want to waste uh, a lot of bandwidth or something like that. So let's take a look at how we can achieve um, a simple scenario such as this one. All right. So this is something that we can handle through page.route. We have to specify, you know, which routes will be um, affected by what we're doing. In this case, we're going to just use all routes. So I'm going to go ahead and print out at the beginning. Then we're going to do something different. I'm going to print out, uh, you know, all the requests that are coming through this route. Again, these should be all the requests, right? We're not filtering any at the moment. We can do a route dot request and yeah, that, that should be enough. Or actually, let's just make it a little bit easier and, and just take a look at the URL. So let's launch that again. As you can see, what's happening here is that we are actually stuck. The first request to Etsy.com is going out, but we are timing out after a little bit here. Why? What happened? Well, what we're doing here is really intercepting a request and then holding it, right? So we are kind of blocking the whole normal flow of the script and of the of the page load itself. So instead, what we need to do is add a little route.continue. And that is just gonna, is essentially saying, okay, let this go, right? Let, let's, uh, let's complete this request and go on as normal. So let's try it out now. And as you can see here, we're again back to square one in a sense. We're just logging all the different uh, images and so on. But now what we can do 
is something a little bit more destructive maybe, right? So what, what we were saying before is we maybe wanted to get rid of um, all image requests, right? So we've seen a resource type before. What we can do is just uh, essentially have, a, have an if that's saying, hey, if my requests resource type, so we do route dot request dot resource type is image, then actually return route dot abort. And if that's not the case, then we can actually just do a route dot continue. All right, let's try that one out, but with the inspector so that we can actually see uh, in a clearer fashion, you know, what's going on. So here's the browser and here's the inspector. We can go ahead and step through the different instructions. And what you see already from here is the images are missing, right? We see the alt text here, but the images are not being loaded. And we can go through the rest of the, of the check uh, of the script execution here and uh, no image is gonna be loaded, right? We only have the Etsy logo there because that is probably a different resource type. But as you can see, we essentially went through our script without loading the images. What's also interesting to try out is, for example, getting rid of all the scripts, right? So all the JavaScript here is essentially not going to work. Let's take a look at how that looks like. We load the page and immediately you see that things look not quite as expected and you can take a look at uh, you know the places where you would find some JavaScript probably some something a little bit more dynamic and you can see here for example we have no drop down until we actually end up clicking you can see a bunch of things are not really loading and uh, for example we can try to add something to our liked items and that won't work so we've essentially sabotaged the website and it only works partially as you've seen, we can easily control the flow of requests and responses uh, depending on criteria of our choosing. Another thing that is enabled by having so much control over the uh, network exchanges is uh, stubbing. So we can alter the content or, or other properties of a response and use that, uh, for example, in the context of testing. Sometimes this is called mocking. There is, there is a subtle difference, I would say, between stubbing and mocking, which does have, uh, it's not, it's not inconsequential. It does have its importance, but I'm not going to dive into that now. I'm going to leave it aside for this specific video. So let's take a look at how Danube, our demo web shop looks like right now and how it works. So what I'm doing here is I am pulling up the inspector and we're just waiting and we're just fully loading the page here without any restrictions. And uh, what you can see is we have a bunch of essentially books, uh, a bunch of products here that are loaded together with the homepage. Now, where are those coming from? Are those part of our HTML here initially? Well, actually, no. So let's actually open the network tab here and reload this page. We can see a bunch of things are going on. Now, this is a demo website, so there's not a lot of traffic going through. And actually what you can see is that we are querying a backend for those books that you see here. Let's take a look at the first one. Haben oder Haben? Well, it's right there, right? And all the other books that you see here on the homepage are also being returned by some sort of backend. And that means if we actually alter the responses here, we can control what happens here on the homepage, what is shown, which products, right? So let's take a look at how we can set that up. What we could do here is essentially take a look at the structure of the information that's being uh, sent back and just copy it for the moment. We can then create an object that maps to that same structure but has different content. We can enter whatever we like here. This is supposed to be an array of objects in this case. What we will do is we will just uh, use an array with one object and uh, we can essentially enter all the details as we like. We have total control over that. Okay, so we have the object created here. Now what we want to do is again, set up something with page.route that does exactly what we want. In this case, uh, change uh, the, the response for a specific route, right? So let's set that up. 
await page.route, and then we need the route, right? So we need to actually go back and take a look at our network tab again. We can refresh the page, find the XHR request that we're looking for. In this case, let me make that a little bit bigger. Just switching to the headers tab, we see the request URL, right? This is what we're interested in, and this is what we will be using as our route. So let's copy that. We can paste it in here. And we're gonna go ahead and explain essentially what needs to happen every time we have this route. And what we're gonna use is just route.fulfill. And here we're gonna explicitly declare the body of the response that we're setting up. And in this case, what we want to do is take that response object, right? But what we need to do is uh, we want this to be sent over as JSON, right? So what we can do is just use JSON stringify, passing that object. And actually what we might want to do as well is specify what kind of content this is so we can uh, set the uh, content type header as well. And uh, that will be, in this case, just application JSON. Okay, let's save and try things out. As you can see, the website is loading exactly as expected. The difference here is that we're telling our browser what it should return when such a call is made, right? And uh, again, we're sort of getting in there right in the middle and saying, hey, this is the response that you're gonna send back. Again, there is no backend that is sending this specific bit of information back. Uh, this is uh, entirely provided by us through our Playwright script in this case. And that's pretty awesome because it means we actually don't need, in case we have a, we have a test and uh, you know we need to, um, we have some sort of requirement to satisfy uh, through some dependency, we can essentially take the actual backend or dependency out of the picture and uh, just uh, cut everything short and say, hey, this is what that would be returning, right? Um, and that enables us a lot more freedom. Uh, it enables us to predict the, you know, how the environment in which we're testing is gonna work. And uh, it takes away one point of failure that might be completely unrelated to what you're trying to test. So uh, it's, a, it's a very powerful tool and Playwright makes it very easy for us to use. I encourage you to keep playing with this and maybe trying it out with your own experiments and in your own scenarios. Make sure that you take a look at the documentation for route, right, which we have uh, used extensively. I hope that was useful and thanks for listening.